Hey everyone, do you need a project for those long cold winter nights? Something you can wow the neighbors with and show off to your friends and family? Well how about testing out a 6 volt generator? That's what we're going to do today. So this is more or less a simple test to see whether your generator is any good at all. Um, it by no means tells you the complete picture of the output of the generator. And for that it would be necessary to put it on an actual tester or test it while on the car. But, so I have the generator in the vise and I'm just going to ground it to the case. You can ground it on the vise. have my 6 volt battery hooked up. Now I'm going to hook the field terminal marked with an F to the ground and then when I connect the power to the armature terminal should start spinning. You know what, I'm going to take this cover off. Maybe we can see some sparks. There she goes. Now if I remove the jumper from the field, it should speed up, indicating my windings are okay, which it certainly does. She's snapping and popping in there. She's running. So we know there will be some kind of output on this generator. Um, which is very good news. While we're having fun, let's just test the starter. Are you ready? Oh man! Let's get you in on that. I've, sound, uh, <laughs> I've heard better starters in my life, but this one also hasn't been used for 30 years. Inspection of the generator is generally similar to that of the starting motor. Check the brushes. This one, less than half its original length, should be replaced. To replace brushes, the generator should be removed and work done at the bench. To properly seat new brushes, hold a seating stone against the turning commutator. Particles of stone are spread beneath the brushes, seating them very quickly. Inspect the commutator for flat spots. If it is thrown solder, the armature is overheating and must be repaired or replaced. Otherwise, clean the commutator with double aught sandpaper. Never use emery cloth. Springs with improper tension cause excess wear and should be replaced. Now, unhook the fan belt from the generator pulley. and 
check the armature shaft for play or roughness. As a further test, run the engine and check for unusual vibration which might indicate roughness in the armature shaft bearings. Check the fan belt for wear and for proper tension. About one half inch of deflection is correct. Be sure mounting bolts are tight. Check tightness of the terminals. So here's what I think I'm going to do with this. Um, I think I say this almost every video. This project is not about restoration necessarily. It's just about getting the car going. That's all the customer wanted. Um, now anything I work on, I feel I've got to clean it up, make it look pretty. So I'm going to do as quick as a disassembly as I can, paint what needs to be painted. Um, but while we got it apart, maybe we'll do some testing. I'm already pretty sure it's going to work on some level. So, so let's just get busy, do that, see where it leads us. Of course, you want to keep all your parts in order. This bearing feels excellent. I'm still going to take it out because I'm going to sandblast this. There's a shim in there. Pull your armature out. So you, before you can get the frame off the back, you've got to take the leads from the brush, both brushes off, to let it slip past there. You can see how that spring works to keep constant tension on that brush.
All right, now I'm going to attempt to get the the shoes that hold the field coils in there. I'm going to try to get these loose. Oh. These things are all Number one. I need a little cleaning. That is for sure. But everything looks surprisingly good. Well, just drop everything. Okay, I'm going to disassemble these end frames and then we're ready to start cleaning. And I don't know how many times I have said it in the past, I'm going to keep saying it. If you are doing this, take pictures, take notes, bag parts and label them. Even if you think you can do this in a day, if you think you're going to get interrupted, you're just going to want to do that. That bearing feels real good. Hard to believe. Felt washer should be in there. I think that's as far as I'm gonna go. Got the oiler, but I'm gonna sandblast that as well. Now on the rear end frame with the brushes, really all you can do without getting serious and drilling, drilling out parts and stuff is just undo the brushes, pull them off of there. These are riveted on, these spring assemblies. Um, bronze bushing is pressed in there. And I'm just going to do my best to protect these. And we'll just have to clean them really well. If you want to go farther than this, than I'm doing, by all means do it. I blasted it as you saw um, 
blew it out everything off really well with a blowgun. Everything I've paint we're gonna paint. I've wiped down with acetone, blew it off really good again. So we'll paint them. Um, and then I'm just on these aluminum frame pieces. I've uh, been wire brushing them, get rid of the soft texture and bring some shine back on them. So that is all. I noticed on this one, well, somewhere here. Yeah, that hole there, someone really wallered it out, or I bet you they had too small of a belt, and that was their solution. Interesting. Alright, really the only thing on the rear frame I need to worry about is putting the brushes back in. Put the lead next to the frame. And make some little elbows. You can use some Allen wrenches. Whatever you want to do. But get the top on the top, the end surface of the brush. I don't want that hitting the armature. Same thing over here. Okay. Set that aside. Well, at some point in the deer dim past, someone had rebuilt this a little bit wrong, at least according to the manual. So you want to put this retainer in first, and it indexes where the hole for the oil comes in. And then you want your felt washer. Those two things were backwards when I took it apart. So that should fit nicely in the bearing. And then you want to take a light oil or motor oil and just drip it in there. Just don't want to put stuff together dry. That should fit nicely in there by hand. Okay, I'm just going to pause to interject really quickly here. Okay, so I put the retainer in, then the felt washer, then the bearing. Felt washer is right up against the bearing. We turn to our Chevrolet shop manual, 42 to 48. Look at the diagram. They have the retainer, the felt washer, the bearing. The felt washer is right up against the bearing. Okay. Just for fun, I was looking at my Chevrolet parts reference guide here. This is from 1952. Covers a whole, um, I think, back into the 20s. We look at our generator assembly. Well, looky here. We have the felt washer, then the retainer, then the bearing. That's how it came apart. That's opposite of how I just put it back together. Hmm. Thoroughly confused. Now, I knew there were scans online of the Delco Remy catalog. This is from 1928 to 1948, and on the generator group that the 48 used, they have 40 and 50 listed here. Those are the part numbers for the retainer and the felt washer. They don't even show what order they should go in. That is helpful. Boy, that's helpful. So, what do you guys think? Does anyone out there know for sure? How can you know for sure? To me, the purpose of a felt washer is to hold oil and keep the bearing lubricated. How can it 
do that if there's a retainer in between the two. But at the same time, will the felt washer get torn up by the spinning bearing? I don't know. I'm going to leave it how it is. If someone out there knows a definite answer, let me know. And then your retainer, and make sure the gasket is intact on your retainer as well. Okay, and then you have a narrow shim that goes on the back side, and you have a wide one, or a collar, that goes on the front. Well, both the front and the rear frames are indexed, so you can't get them mixed up. There's a button here and a hole there on the rear one. Let's get our coils back in. And these electrical parts, um, I actually put them in the solvent tank and got all the junk off and then put them out in the sun and let them dry out. Now this is about impossible to get mixed up. You know your terminals have to go towards the rear and they come together such a way that they have to be where they have to go. So. Do you see the brush snap down? Just want to make sure that the end of this tab, spring-loaded tab, is pushing against the very end of the brush. So they are being held down. Okay, again, on the front frame we've got a button on the case and a hole on the frame. Make sure you have this shim in there. shim is causing me problems.
To inspect the starting motor, first remove the cover band. Check the length of the brushes. Those worn to less than half their original length should be replaced. Examine the commutator for high mica, flat spots, or pits. When using the screwdriver, be extremely careful to insert the blade only at the metal risers. Do not touch the commutator or the wiring. If the commutator is dirty, switch on the starter and clean it with a piece of double-aught sandpaper wrapped around a stick. Never use emery cloth. Check bushings of the starter housing for radio play. These show no appreciable play. Before testing the starting switch, disconnect the ground strap from the battery to prevent short circuit. Remove the switch. and carefully inspect the terminals. Switches with damaged terminals should be replaced. See that all connections are tight. Now as for the starter, there are obvious differences of course, but we have the same basic elements going on here. Um, I'm going to start with taking the foot controls off, that go to the starter button, get them out of the way. I highly recommend you snap a picture of this, that will help you going back together. Okay, well, I have everything disassembled as far as I'm going to go, I believe. A few quick words on some things. 
the field coils and the starter are soldered in at this point so you can't get the contact out so what I'm gonna do instead of sandblasting this I'm gonna clean the outside as good as I can with a wire wheel and then we'll flush it all out really good with in my solvent tank I would have cleaned these the dirt and the grime off in the solvent tank anyway um, just be sure if you're doing one of these um, make sure the wrapping is intact which both of mine have looked really good so they will be fine and we'll let that dry and then paint it this armature is much cleaner well both things are much cleaner than the generator were was um, still probably rinse this off with solvent brushes look great as they did on the generator so I will probably wrap this up really good sandblast just this flush it off with air and solvent or uh, brake cleaner or something um, I think that's about it we'll just get to work Well, I wish I would have thought of this when I was doing the generator, but I didn't. But this cover strap that goes on the back, um, you saw I just painted it with Rust-Oleum on the generator. And I was thinking today, you know, I still have some of that gun blowing from rebuilding the, well, I used it on the Daisy BB gun video and used a little on that Delco horn video. And when I cleaned this up, you could tell that this this had a bluing. It wasn't painted. Um, so, just for fun, we're going to try it. Now, I've knocked down the rough, et, or rough surface that sandblasting leaves and uh, with sandpaper. So, I got it all shiny and smooth there's perma blue and this is called super blue um, they're available at I got mine at Walmart very easy I think they do have a clear coat for it. I may even try clear coating it with Rust-Oleum. We'll see. I don't know if that'll work. I'll let you know. That's it. Well, that turned out more blackish than anything. I may try another coat. They say to uh, knock it down with steel wool if you want to try it again. But I think that'll only make it darker. I might try letting it dry out and see if it changes any.
hey, you know, I, I did that initial coat, and I knocked it down with steel wool, and I'm going to leave it there. Once I hit it with that steel wool, it looked a whole lot better. So I'm not going to redo it. I don't want to get it any darker. Yeah. I should do that on the generator. Probably won't. Both bushings were quite worn out, so I'm going to replace them. Now, if you can find something to push against this, I mean, they are so thin. Here's a new one. Um, and press it out in the presser with the vise, then that's good. Um, I can't find anything that works real well close at hand, so I've just been slowly working this out with a punch. So if you need to replace the bushing on the rear plate, here's what I did. I started trying to use my fancy OTC bearing bushing puller, and that was getting me nowhere, and I was afraid I was going to damage this aluminum if I tried too hard, holding it in a vise or whatever. So I just took a nail and I sharpened it on two sides, kind of like a sharp screwdriver, because you, you just need the finest thing you can possibly make to uh, get between the aluminum and the bushing. And I just chose a spot that looked promising and started driving that down in there. And all we're going to do is just collapse this bushing. It's actually tearing apart where I'm driving it down. I can't believe that thing didn't want to pull out of there. But as soon as you get it collapsed, you can get in there with a screwdriver or something. It may even come out now if I try. I'm amazed that did not come out with that puller. But I think, I think this is so thin that when I was grabbing when I expand this it just expands the bushing against the aluminum and it wasn't wanting to come out because of that so all right we'll push this one in I can holy moly I could do it with hand by hand I actually got these all these parts off the shelf at my favorite parts store. We were all surprised they had them. I picked up brushes because, you know, to look at these, I thought they were worn down quite a ways. But the new ones aren't any longer. I mean, just slightly, perhaps. So I'm not even going to bother replacing the brushes. I mean, maybe a sixteenth of an inch is all I would gain. So I'm going to leave these for now. Um, yeah, so let's get back to get going back together. Okay, I'm going to put my armature on the end plate. I'll just do a drop of oil. Don't need much. Now we can release our brushes. Huh. 
again like the generator you have index points a little button and a hole on the case Cross thread, come on. Now, this Bendix drive I did clean up with um, solvent, but I kept it like this and washed everything down they warn you in the manual not to get the clutch clean or not to soak it in solvent or gas and clean it because that would get in there and mess up what's going on inside with the springs and the rollers and so forth so just be aware of that um, these are available new in fact anything you need is available new on both of these units um, a lot of the specialty parts houses, Chevs of the 40s, the filling station, Jim Carter, etc., etc., has a lot of the stuff you need. You may not find armatures and windings there, um, but you can get on eBay and find them, I believe. So, just know that, but uh, the spring is great. I think the clutch worked fine. And... We'll just put her back in there. Okay, you kind of have to throw this all together at the same time. Now all these clear parts that you see externally, I just cleaned them up and I coated them with Rust-Oleum clear coat. Put some anti-sneeze on the bolt here. I'll just put that on and we'll tighten it later. Now you may have noticed when I tested this on my workbench at home, there was quite a bit of end play in the shaft, the armature shaft back and forth. And uh, that's not supposed to be there. I mean, that was that wore in. Now, there was a shim in there, so I'm going to add another one. And I just actually made this. I found a washer of the right outer diameter and used a step drill to drill out the inside to the right inner diameter. And that'll be a lot better. There's still just a tiny bit. Um, okay, I bet you once we tighten those bolts up, that'll be just fine. Now on your switch, just make sure everything's clean and in good order. This very simple thing is terminal that's connected to the battery cable, terminal on the starter, and when you push your foot on the starter pedal, this center contact just bridges the gap. You also have plastic or Bakelite insulators for the sides. If those are missing or broken, or brittle. You can just make new ones out of plastic. If you don't have them, there's a very good chance your uh,
contact will short against the side there. So Again, I just cleaned this switch up and then clear coated it so that bare metal will stay nice and bright looking. Clear coated all these pieces as well. I want this on here first. The washer. Pin. Something like that. And we'll finish up with the cover. Well there we go. I got both the units back home. They're both still working like they did when they left. Um, one thing I also didn't mention is available. You can search for these tags if you want to replace them and you'll have to punch new numbers but those are available if you're going for a full-on restoration. Um, the generator I spent a fraction of can of spray paint and about 10 drops of oil so let's say a good 27 cents. The starter, I took out all the stops. I used three different types of paint. So we might be up to, oh, 35 cents there. 10 drops of oil, you know, another 5 cents. And then, I really went all out and put those two bushings in. So that might have cost $10 total. So, that was an expensive unit right there. But it looks good. So I really like what the engineers were thinking. Um, they've got bolts with castle nuts, and you put your pins in there. And then you've, of course, you've got a hinge point. So you can always, you don't have to bother with loosening all three bolts when you need to change the belt or adjust the tension. Pretty slick. And that's one thing I do not have on the shelf is a new belt. So I'm going to temporarily reinstall the old one. Just to finish it up for you. Well, I know this is going to be extremely difficult for you to see what's going on. That battery tray probably should not have put it on, but at this point I really don't want to take it back off. But you have a stud on the top for the top bolt on the starter, so you can hang it on there. And then there's a bolt on the bottom, and they are a form of lock nut and lock bolt. I'll show you on the bolt here in a second. Kind of like a version of a modern serrated flange bolt or a whiz nut. Eh, I don't know if we're going to focus enough but there are lines on the bottom. It's both on the nut and on the bottom of this bolt head. And that is to grab so you do not need lock washers. I'm going to see if I can get this from the top. Well, I'm close. 
Oh, why did I put that there? Tray there. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay, here's a better view. Bolts are tight. The lever is hooked up to the foot pedal. The spring gets connected to the same bracket as the pedal, which pulls it back. Now we can hook our battery up. We can give it a test. Alright, sorry about that. Um, I forgot to put the hold down frame on and I didn't have bolts when I got the car so I'm going to have to find some of those. We got our cables on and I just want to say when you're dealing with 6 volt systems you've got to have proper battery cables. You've got to have proper wiring, sized wiring no matter what. But they've got to be heavier than a 12 volt system. Don't go to Walmart and get battery cables for a 6 volt system. Get proper sized wiring. Everything's hooked up. No fires so far. Why don't we try cranking it? Now guys, I do not have oil in this engine. There's assembly lube, so I'm only going to crank it just for a brief second. Spark plugs are out. Better take that off. Cross your fingers and your toes. Okay, well, let's talk about a few things real quick and then we'll say adios. If that sounded like it was cranking really slow, well, it was. Okay, like I said, I only have assembly lube in here, and when I before I started doing videos on this project, I plastigaged the bearings, and I took out some shims, and I have the correct clearance, but it wanted to spin pretty hard, the crank. So I'm confident that'll loosen up once I get the engine running. And uh, the other thing is, if you have a 6 volt system in a classic car and it is cranking slow, you do not need to convert it to 12 volts. I mean, you do what you want, but um, converting to 12 volts entails rewiring new headlight switch, new regulator, uh, new generator, or alternator. Um, a whole lot of things, but the mistakes guys make on these old cars is first of all they're old, the grounds are bad and corroded, so if you have, and they, and they put in improper battery cables through all the years, at some point 12 volt battery cables have probably been put in and they're way too small. So before you convert to 12 volts because you're sick and tired of how slow it cranks, um, Make sure you have the correct size cables, make sure all your grounds are clean, proper, you know, your battery's good, and I bet you it'll spin a whole lot better. Now the other thing I did not cover in the course of this video is testing your armatures and your field coils. 
Um, obviously, in the beginning of the video, both of these units spun, so they were working. Um, there really wouldn't be much to show you other than showing you a good result. Um, I'm going to put a couple videos in the description below of testing those two things. Now on the starter, I was a bit concerned because it obviously worked, but when I bent or when I uh, took it apart, I tested the field coils with my meter and I had a tenth of an ohm resistance across the two terminals. And pretty uni pretty much universally on the internet anywhere, um, you find field coils should give resistance more like 3.5 ohms. Um, so I was a little concerned. However, when you look in the Chevrolet manual from 42 to 48, it says, well Chevrolet had this nifty little test stand for armatures and field coils. It had leads, it had a little coil deal, you can put the armature on and do a growl test and all kinds of stuff. But it said for testing field coils, you go across the terminals with your probes and if a light lights up on the test equipment, then the field coil is good. So all it's doing is conducting electricity. That's all it's testing. The light comes on, electricity flows through the coils. They gave no values whatsoever of resistance through the field coils. So I went ahead and put it back together on the assumption that it was okay because according to that it would be okay. And obviously on my test on the workbench it spun. The only thing I was concerned about is would it spin strong enough. And obviously on a tight crankshaft with only assembly lube it did. So there you go. Thanks for joining me. Um, I am not charging him over a thousand dollars for this by the way. I was just kidding. Although it's worth it. Check the ammeter. Tap the glass lightly if the indicator is sluggish.